And we're absolutely delighted that we have one of the leading authorities on this topic with us today from Trinity College Dublin. Conor McGuckin has been working in this field in this area of work since he did his PhD studies um, and really has been leading the debates and the academic research that's been going on in relation to bullying uh, within schools at a whole range of different age groups. Um, he's currently, as I said, in the School of Education at Trinity College Dublin and he moved there from uh, University of Ulster, the McGee campus where I myself am based. Um, I'm not going to say any more about Connor. The format for today is that Connor will present for about 35, 40 minutes. Then we'll have an opportunity for some questions, comments, or just uh, discussion amongst yourselves and with Connor. And then about one o'clock, there's a sandwich lunch served outside, and you're welcome to stay and join us for that and continue the conversations about the about the seminar, if that's okay. So, Connor, we're delighted to have you, and thank you very much indeed. Oh, and I forgot one thing, but I'll tell it at the end. <laughs> Thanks, Gillian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I um, hope you can hear me. I'll, I'll try not to stand too close to these mics. Uh, really what I want to talk about is some of the analysis we've been doing on the kids' life and time, so with primary seven uh, children. And just, as with all of these things, just to remember where the emergency exits are. I'll do my, we can go this way, and also in terms of mobile phones, just in case you don't need it for an emergency. It might be useful to make sure it's powered off. Uh, I'm from the School of Education and within the School of Education we house the Anti-Bullying Centre and we try to do a full range of services within the Anti-Bullying Centre from the research end to the practice end. We have a barrister working in the centre, we have the helpline for schools, for workplaces, for parents to try and give any kind of guidance or support that, that might be needed. We try and do large scale national surveys, we do a lot of work similar to what ARC do as well. And we really try to take a, a full psychological and scientific kind of approach to understanding what's going on in childhood bullying right through into workplace bullying as well. So that's sort of the remit of the Anti-Bullying Centre. And I think the remit has grown a little bit in terms of their, their view now that I've joined as well because we now have that full uh, perspective of the whole island of Ireland. I think sometimes whenever we speak as adults about bullying we tend to have a different mindset about what might be bullying than what children would have. So just very quickly, I just want to sort of put in your mind where we'd be coming at in these surveys in what we actually mean by the term bullying. And I know that there's all lots of different definitions. You can see them everywhere. And I think it's back to that. If you're being bullied, you pretty much know that you're being bullied. It doesn't matter if the definition. But when we go into schools and we work with children, we have to give them some, some kind of a reference in terms of definition or the time period. So the tentative agreement in the world of bullying research is that no matter what the definition is, it would conform to the three criteria that we have here. That there would be some kind of aggressive behaviour or intentional harm doing. The key aspect then of bullying is generally that it's repeated and it's over time with the small caveat that maybe one instant could actually be conceived as bullying. And there would be some kind of an inter interpersonal uh, relationship with some kind of an imbalance of power. And the imbalance of power could be psychological as opposed to just physical. So it doesn't matter how we dress up the definition as long as we try to get these three things in. And if anyone was interested in workplace bullying, these kind of definitions become even more critical because you have to build in, in terms of the law, the issue of frequency and duration as well. In terms of the international research, most of the national and international studies will have used a, an instrument called the Always Bully Victim Scale. And this is the one that was developed for the first major European studies in Norway about 20 or 30 years ago. The two key items are up on the, the overhead here. And really, they just ask about, in the past two months, how often have you been a victim? and it allows the, the pupil to say, well, they haven't been, or at what range. I'll come back to the importance of this in two or three slides, but a key thing here is that we've given an anchor, a time reference point, so since Easter or since Christmas, so that the child can actually focus in and that they're not thinking that it's any time in my life or over the past year. It's in the past two months. And then we've got in uh, the different things that we can actually categorize that you've been maybe victimized sometimes or more often, or perhaps more frequently. And from these two items, we can do a lot of work to figure out how many children are perhaps a pure victim or a pure bully, 
or the unfortunate category where you have children who are both a bully and a victim at the same time. And of course, we can construct the fourth actor group, which are the bystanders. So bullying generally happens in small social groups that meet regular, meet often, have some kind of social norm, everybody takes on a role. So we tend to think of them as being the bully, the victim, the bully victim, and the bystander. So that's where we do a lot of our research. There's been a lot of talk, and bullying is always in the media. Nearly every survey comes out, people would phone me and say, it's really interesting we found out that children talked about bullying. And we're sort of saying, well, it's not rocket science. Of course they're going to talk about it because it's a major issue for them. But some of the more social aspects of bullying have changed, and we've had a lot of focus on some of these perhaps newer focused types of bullying, the racial and the homophobic over the past few years. We're not saying that these are new, it's perhaps that society, and for childhood as well, that we now can put our hands up and talk about all of these different aspects of experience. We're doing some research this year that will take a look at special education needs, disabilities, and we're going to do that as a joint north-south project. So we're looking at disabled bullying this year. I was at a meeting in the Department of uh, Children's Schools and Families in London last month. Their new guidelines are coming out to schools now about sexist, sexual and transphobic bullying, and that will probably go into primary schools now as well. So there's a lot of focus on these. And of course the one that is major concern for us, major concern for schools at the minute, is the cyberbullying. And it's interesting that this was asked about in this survey, so I'll talk about this later on. Part of what I've been looking at with the Life and Times and the Kids' Life and Times is, well, what is the output? Let's categorise how many have been victim, victims or bullies, but what's the health and well-being? Well, the general view from the literature is that there is no positive outcome, regardless of which category you are. There will be some effects on your educational attainment, on your health and well-being currently, perhaps on a road down the towards crime, delinquency, incarceration, future relationship problems. These are facts that we now know from the international literature. This is why it's so important to rule out bullying as early as possible. And that's why Kids Life and Times is quite useful here, because it's tackling it at primary school level before children transfer into post-primary. And of course, at post-primary, in that first year, we've got everyone jockeying for position. Who is the most important within the, the social group within that first year. So if we can rule it out here, and in terms of the gateway behaviours, what we tend to think about in psychology and, and social work and social policy, is that if you were a victim or a bully, it may lead you to be a truant, and if you become a truant, it may open the gate to smoking. That in turn may open the gate. You may take some drink of alcohol, you may take some drugs, you may engage in sexual activity, and on it goes. So one negative behaviour opens the gate to another one. And these are the correlates, these are the things that we know happen with children involved in bullying and victimisation. So what would we expect to sort of find if we did the survey in Northern Ireland? Well, we've pretty much done a lot of cross-national research in bully victim problems. We can now have a cross-national perspective. There's a couple of good books out on it. We've written some of that stuff as well. But we made an argument in 2003, and we were really making this argument from about 1999, is that we need to have a lot more research about bullying in Northern Ireland. And we need it to be very focused, asking the same types of questions, build up some knowledge. Because, and I know that I'm preaching to the converted in this kind of a room, because, you know, it used to be the argument that we don't need to do a lot of research in Northern Ireland, because surely it's the same in Belfast, as in Bradford, as in Birmingham, as in London. And we were saying, yes, geographically, close to all of those places, but culturally, completely different even in terms of schooling and stuff like that. So that's why we've been trying to plot what's been going on in Northern Ireland across this area. This is Department of Education research. So this is some of the, the bigger research that's been published so far in the North. And just to give you a ballpark of where we'd be thinking of. In terms of primary school pupils, 40% uh, said that they've been victims again within the past two months. Slightly lower for post-primary, but we would expect that because as children get older, they can actually cope with things in relationships a lot better. They don't need to resort to bullying just as much. So we always do see a little decrease. And of course then, the, the bottom two bullet points, we actually see a smaller number admitting that they've been a bully. And it's the typical in terms of a, the abuse literature. 
that a perpetrator would have multiple victims. So we would always have lower numbers of bullies as opposed to the number of victims. It's interesting this figure of 40% seems to remain quite static across a lot of the cross-national studies. And the, the latest data from the Growing Up in Ireland study that's happening in the South is that across nine-year-old pupils, 40% of them are saying, I have been bullied at school. And even if we don't believe that 40% of the young people, 23% of their parents are saying, yes, this is an issue for my child. So it still begs the question, why do we allow all of this to happen within schools? I'll skip through this one, but this was just a follow-up. And again, we can see uh, somewhat similar figures. I'll leave that one with you. So coming on to the key work that ARC are doing, and I know some people are quite aware of the work that ARC do. It's the uh, Social and Political Archive, joint project, as Gillian said, between the two universities. The Northern Ireland Life and Times Survey, building up a, a lovely um, overview of political and social attitudes of adults across Northern Ireland. Most of the work I've been involved in with this has been with the Young Life and Times, where we've analysed what has been asked in terms of bullying from 1998 to 2005. And recently, Kids Life and Times has come on stream, and what I'll present today is some of our analysis from the 2008 and 2009 surveys of that one. If you're not sure where to get this information, it's on the ARC homepage, arc.ac.uk, and if you click on surveys, it'll give you a link to the Kids Life and Times survey. Um, one of my favourite two websites, the other one being all of the stuff that's housed up in McGee in terms of Incor and Cain, uh, my absolute two favourite websites in the world. Uh, I don't get out enough. Uh, <laughs> um, and what we like about the Kids Life and Times is that quite often in international research that you know, we, we tend to make the decisions for our children rather than give them the voice. And if we give them the voice, they can give us the answers. And quite often when I go out to schools, they laugh at me and they say, like, your, your shoes are too shiny and your tie is too silly and what do you know about being at school? And it's true. We live in the ivory tower, we do our research in our offices, but when we actually ask children what is important to you, they can actually give us that answer. So in terms of the sample, Fairly healthy sample, nearly 3,500 pupils in 2008 and 2009. And we'll take a look at some of the work that we've been doing. I must say, we were absolutely delighted that in 2008 there were 10 questions. And we feel very lucky for, we know that there's a lot of competition for room within these surveys. There was 10 questions in 2008, nine of those were asked in 2009. And just to sort of interpret these a little bit for you, uh, because sometimes people look at the questions and they think, you know, this is great. Somebody sat in the office and just made this up. But there's a story behind each item. In terms of the top one, it's just a nice general, how much victimization do you think is going on in your school? And then after that, we've got a lovely little package of questions based around your personal experience of being a victim. And again, you can see in the last two months, so we're replicating the international flavour. We're replicating that in terms of the first two questions as well. How often did you get physically bullied? And how often did you get bullied in other ways? And we would call that relational bullying. Because quite often at this age, you're picking up maybe differences between boys and girls. Boys will refer quite a lot to the physical kind of bullying. They'll hit each other, they'll punch each other, they kick each other, but tomorrow they're going to be friends again. Whereas girls, a little bit different, better language ability, they play in tighter friendship groups, so they can't get away with the physical stuff. So they have to become much more subtle and psychological and someone make the snowballs for somebody else to fire it. Now we know that they do bully at the same amount, but sometimes they use different strategies. So these two questions would pick that up. And again, we can interpret back to the international literature because of the anchor of the two months. So we've got direct bullying, indirect bullying, and lovely that we've got some inclusion now of cyberbullying. Uh, it's interesting, children don't actually call it cyberbullying, we do. They just talk about things that happen with their mobile phones, with the internet. But we, as adults and researchers, talk about cyberbullying. So we've got that nice package around being a victim, and we can interpret with that. Then the questions sort of reverse order, and it's the same kind of questions about taking part in bullying others. So again, we can pick up, have you been a victim, and by what way? Have you been a bully? and by what way, and 
the experience of cyberbullying. As with any of these things, it's always useful to find out if what we're doing at a policy level, if what we're doing from the Department of Education, from the government, from adults, from the school, from the anti-bullying policy, from the discipline policy, from the code of conduct, is that working? And the best way to do that is ask the people that it affects most. And we have this in three questions. Is there someone you can identify in your school who has a responsibility to deal with bullying? Is there a set of rules on bullying? And by law, there should be. And have you talked about this in your class? So we'll come back and take a look at some of the analysis of these. So at a blunt level, how many are involved? Well, across 2008 and 2009, primary seven pupils are telling us approximately 50% is the answer if we look at a little and a lot. So a lot, about five or six percent, that would be the very frequent stuff. In terms of the international view, that would be almost like on a daily level, on a weekly level, uh, a, little, a little bit more sporadic over the week or two. So about 50% are saying, yes, bullying happens in the school. And the take home message I take from that is that this is a representative survey across the whole of Northern Ireland. Nobody's forcing anybody to do this. These are children. They're they're just answering it, and what children tend to do is they tell you the truth. You ask them the question, and here's the answer. So 50% are saying, yes, there is bullying in our school. If we break on down another little bit, and we start to ask about personal experience of victimization, well, in terms of personal, the sort of top row there, in terms of personal experience of victimization from a physical level, across the two years, it sort of averages out around about 22%, so just under a quarter. In terms of sort of relational bullying over the, the two years, it's in and around about 36%. That's quite high considering that the physical stuff is peaking at about 22%. There's actually a lot more subtle bullying going on. And the subtle stuff is harder to pick up. We can't pick up the, the physical stuff because it happens behind the mobiles and everywhere else, in the cloakrooms and the toilets. But this subtle stuff is even more insidious for children as well. And in terms of experience of the cyberbullying, in and around about 11%. So we can start to see already that there's a persistency here with the physical and the psychological. And we've got this new emerging trend with the, the cyber stuff. In terms of those questions around being a bully, again, did you take part in bullying other children by physical means? It averages out about 8%. In the next column there, or sorry, the next row, we're in at about 3% for the more psychological forms, and then 3% in 2008 for using your mobile phone or text messaging to, to bully someone. And again, these figures will be lower because there's generally lower amounts of bullies, and also people are more loath to admit that they are a bully than they are a victim. So even if you attenuate some of the figures, there's still a disparity there. So what about the management? And we had three questions about the management of this within schools. And I took great heart in this, that the children are able to identify, but at one level they're able to identify that there are people in schools, there are policies in schools, and that they have talked about it. But despite this, and these are all very high figures, 70%, 85%, 85%, but they're still experiencing lots of physical bullying, lots of psychological bullying, and now there's some of this cyberbullying coming on board. And I know that some schools, they take the reaction, well, what we'll do is we'll ban mobile phones. Well, we've just got the first study, the first proper international study, and it doesn't work. Just banning stuff does not work, and we should nearly know that as adults. It's sort of intuitive. So we have a lot of great management of this within the schools. And some of the research we did about five years ago, before the law came in, and we actually found out that it's brilliant what schools are doing even when there wasn't a law to say that you have to have an anti-bullying policy. They were doing a brilliant job. And you can still see that there's a great ethos, there's a great spirit, and they drive this through. But why are our children still getting bullied? By physical, by verbal, by psychological, and by cyber. So a little bit of a summary based on those three slides. Well, half of the pupils think that there's bullying in the school. Nearly a quarter of them are getting physically bullied. Just over a third are getting relationally bullied, and about 10% cyber bullied. Slightly smaller rates then for the bullies. 8% bully others physically, 13% percent 
do it relationally, and 3% are freely admitting that they do nasty things like this via mobile phone or something. And great figures in terms of what's going on in schools in terms of management. The health effects and the health-related aspects of being in school and the children was also explored within the surveys. The kids screen was used. The kids screen's an international survey tool that can pick up all of the different things about perception of quality of life across these five, or sorry, six main, five main areas. And there's examples of some of the questions. So thinking about the past week, have you felt full of energy? Thinking about the last week, have you been able to talk to your parents when you wanted to? Have you and your friends helped each other? So we tap into all of those different aspects of health and well-being. What we've done is we've done some analysis based around that. And really, I'm not going to present the, the in-depth detail of that analysis here, uh, but really what the, the figures are is that if you're involved as either a bully or a victim, that there are negative impacts on all of those previous points. More so if you've been physically bullied and relationally bullied than in terms of cyberbullying, but the impact is there. Maybe not as strong as you might see for slightly older adolescents, <coughs> for the young people, but we still have that. In terms of the happiness and some of the, re the, the stuff that has been output on the website, that, for example, children who said that they were mostly unhappy at school were seven times more likely than the, than the happier pupils to be either physically or relationally bullied. And happiness is one of those Little things, people keep asking me, what can we do to stop bullying in schools? There's two or three very basic little things and they don't cost much money. Can we just help them to be happy? And if they're happier, they're more productive, they're psychologically better off, and they're actually protected against this. How many good friends they have? And we have a dose effect, which we see down here. So you're actually more protected according to the number of good friends that you have. And the other thing that we might actually be able to rule this stuff out with is if whenever children actually say, I'm being bullied, that we might actually listen to them rather than dismiss them. Quite often when a child comes down from bed and says, there's a big monster under the bed, what we tend to do is we go up and we get on our knees and we look under the bed and we say, look, there's no monster there. And the child believes it. But whenever we say, you know, go away and don't be annoying me, you know, you're not being bullied or something, maybe if we just listen to them. Maybe some of those times it'll just be spurious and it won't have happened at all. But if we just listen to them, allow them to tell us. And I think we're brought up in a culture as well where we don't snitch on people, we don't tell on people. And if they pick that up at home, then they're not going to snitch on people at school. So they're never going to put their hand up. They're going to suffer with that. We need to ensure that they're happy, that they have good friends. These things don't cost a lot of money, rather than we have to have an anti-bullying program in every school. Maybe we don't and we've done some research to take a look at that. So we did all the correlations, uh, say, I'll not go into all of these, but pretty much um, if you've been bullied either physically or psychologically, uh, you know, it has a negative effect on your well-being, how you get on with your parents and your friends and your peers and your social support. So in terms of issues for schools, well, what we take out of the two surveys is that the traditional, and it's interesting that it's only in the past two or three years that we've moved away in the literature from sort of talking about bullying, that we now sort of call it traditional bullying, and now we're getting to the little acronym of F2F, face-to-face. -face. So the face-to-face -face bullying is still persistent. 40% still getting bullied. 50% of these kids are saying it's happening in my school. So it's persistent, but I think the interesting thing that we're picking up in this survey, and I know that ARC have uh, already output some of this information about the, the social and digital and media lives of children, we're picking this up, and this is a huge worry for us in terms of the bullying. The always on generation. They're always switched on, they always have their technology. Whenever a lot of us were growing up, it was conflict resolution skills were learnt at home because there weren't enough toys, and maybe six people sharing a bedroom. Now you have one child, one bedroom, one Wii, one laptop, one Xbox, one mobile phone, one of everything for themselves. So they don't learn these conflict resolution skills and they're always switched on. We're doing some work with uh, colleagues in Switzerland around net citizenship. So what is it that we need to learn about the lives that children are leading at the minute? 
I was doing a talk the other day and, and I was relating an example of a conversation that I had at work a couple of weeks ago. And one of the guys said to me over coffee on the Monday, he said it was very interesting. He said I was talking to my son on Friday night and we were just having our dinner and I said to him, uh, have you any nice plans for tonight? And my son said, yeah, going to hang out with my mates, going to hang out with my friends. And he thought, God, this is great. My son is psychologically adjusted. He's well connected. He's got lots of friends. But after dinner, he disappeared into his bedroom and locked the door and wasn't seen until the next day. So the, the father was then thinking, why does my son feel the need to lie to me that he's got all of these friends and everything? He could just tell me I don't have any friends. We could have gone to the cinema, gone bowling or gone for a swim. So the next day he spent a lot of the day thinking about it and thought, I'll challenge him and I'll say, you know, what happened last night? So he did and the son said, but I was, I was hanging out with my friends. We were playing games on the internet and we were chatting on MSN and we were updating our Facebook profiles and all of this and he was like, just couldn't get his head around that his son never left the bedroom, but was totally happy that he was hanging out with his friends all night. So they are, they're always on. Even in this survey, about 93% across the two years of primary seven uh, children have a mobile phone. 93% can get the internet at home and 28% often can get it in their bedroom. And a huge issue that's coming out of this that we're picking up in other research is the lack of supervision, the lack of knowledge. And if they're not being supervised, we don't know what's going on. Because the thing is, the children are living in this cyber world. They are digital natives. But one thing that they can't do, their emotions and their ability to work with their emotions cannot develop as quick as the technology does. One interesting thing that we find out from children in terms of the bullying here is that about 40% of children who get victimized via these kind of means tell us that they will retaliate immediately. They won't do it in the playground in the face-to-face -face scenario, but because it's at a distance with text messages and internet, their emotional repertoire hasn't developed as fast, so they can't actually say, I need to slow down, I need to stop, I need to think about this. So other issues for schools, and I think these are issues for parents as well. They're issues for adults in general, and I think they're issues for any office that have a role in the health and well-being and education and the future of children. Nearly half of them have a social networking profile, even though the sites are saying that these age group of children are too young to be using them. 29% said they like it a lot. 30 and 40% are saying that they include friends who are there, but they don't actually meet face to face. And the two things that we do pick up, supervision is a massive issue, they're not being supervised. But then the other thing is, as adults, as teachers, as parents, we can't teach them if we don't know the skills ourselves. So we need to think about upskilling and getting involved with the digital world of the child. So these are the emerging issues that we're starting to see come through. A couple of years ago, if you had have asked those questions about SMS and cyber, you wouldn't have got anything. Now you're getting 10%. And I dare say if we pick that up in another couple of years, we'll have that up to about 20% or thereabouts, because it's increasing across other countries that are doing some of their research. So we do have this, and it's interesting that at one level, the internet and mobile phones and all of this technology, it's the most open form of communication there is but it's also at the same time the most anonymous, and that's dangerous, and children can't work that kind of thing out. So we do have this byproduct of the union of childhood and adolescent development and what's going on with electronic communication. So we don't have any kind of escape where the child doesn't because it's there. Even if it was one instant, it's able to be repeated over and over and over again. So this temporal quality of it has changed. And even we find out some of the children actually go back to take a look at that clip of the happy slapping or something. So if you're a victim, why would you go back again and again to look at it? To re-traumatize yourself. So we have to think about that. And this notion of the 24-7 availability of it. I think the really good thing in terms of what schools are doing is schools are doing as best they can, according to the children, in terms of the management of bullying in the school. And I'd always be the first to put my hand up and say, I think what schools do in this area is brilliant and they do it with very small amount of resource and there's a great culture, there's a great ethos and there's a great spirit in terms of childhood uh, development, pastoral care and the education of children. I think the schools, and it comes 
comes across here quite clearly, they're doing a great job. But I think what schools might want to think about now is take that leap of faith, think about increasing and linking in about homophobic bullying, the disabled stuff, more about the equality agenda, more about the SST, the sexual, sexist and transphobic, and the cyber stuff as well. Update and have those policies ongoing because they're absolutely useless if they sit on a shelf. A good policy is written, it's used, it's brought back in, it's thought about, it's tweaked, it's used again, and on and on it goes. So they're really good policies. Again, a lot of talk about internet safety. We might just need to keep honing that in a little bit. There are lots of health and well-being problems, and we know that. We're not sure just at the minute from the international sort of area what is the effects in terms of the cyberbullying. But without getting too far off that, we do and we hear quite a lot of these cyber sides and bully sides and children who have taken their own lives because of things that have happened in terms of Facebook and Bebo and stuff like that. So there are serious effects there as well. And again, it's because this kind of stuff is more instant, more instantaneous, but children aren't able to cope with it at the same level because it's instantaneous. Their emotional repertoire isn't developed enough to keep up with that kind of speed. So we have that. And in terms of the legal issues, we see that children at post-primary, and they don't actually realize that with this kind of stuff, they're varying outside the realm of the school. Generally, the, the school thinks of bullying as happening within the, the fence, within that sort of uh, big metal fence at the school. But the cyber stuff, the mobile stuff, goes outside. A lot of children are getting into trouble in that they're disseminating pictures that could be, that could be pornographic, but because of the age group we're dealing with, they're actually dis dissemination of paedophilic imagery. So they're not aware that they're moving into a whole legal sphere here. And maybe we need to talk to them about what would you do if this happened and who would be right and who would be wrong. One of the things we talk to children about is, for example, uh, Debbie went to the beach and Debbie's 10 years old and she had her bikini on and her, she took a picture and she put it up on her Bebo page and then people started calling her fatty and stuff. So how did they deal with that? So it's just to try and help them that they're now living in a different age, a different world and how to deal with these kind of things. So the, the legal issues here are quite important. One thing that is happening, and I think another great website in Northern Ireland, is the Northern Ireland Anti-Bullying Forum. And along with ourselves and our partners from across the Great Britain, we have this British and Irish Anti-Bullying Forum, and we meet twice a year, and we share a lot of resource, a lot of knowledge. And it's almost like at the start, whenever I first went to this, I thought, maybe do we need to have all of this huge coordination? Surely nearly one size fits all. And of course, I was naive. It's incredible the differences that are happening across Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, North and South. So NIABF, brilliant website, some great resources on there, and I encourage people to take a look at that as well. A very interesting approach to this whole area is what they're doing in Scotland. And they don't use the word bully, and they use the word respect me. And what they're trying to do is tap in to the lingo of, of children today. And all children are talking about, you have to respect me and you can't diss me. But they don't actually know what the word respect means. So they try to educate children around the what does the word respect mean. You may not like me, but you might have to respect me. And once they can get that message over, it opens up everything else for them as well. And the Anti-Bullying Alliance and all the good work that they do. I'll finish off just a couple of slides, just briefly mention a couple of European projects that are looking at this whole area and where we're going with the bullying agenda. The cyber training is the EU response to this area. Uh, ourselves, with about six partner countries across Europe, have been working over the past couple of years to develop an e-book, a website, and a training manual. And it'll go live probably in about six months' time on this website, cybertraining-project.org, and it'll be translated into the different languages. The e-book will be there and it will have chapters for dealing with parents or trainers or people within schools. It'll have cartoons, video clips, PowerPoints, resources. It'll all be there. So we're bringing this one home very shortly. And some of the good work that our colleagues in Norway are doing, they've now had um, a UK website. They're called kidsandmedia.co.uk. Again, just the wider uh, arena of childhood development today 
and the role of the media. There's now about 30 European countries working on cyberbullying. It's called COST, and we now have the Australians involved, we have the Americans involved, and over the next two or three years, this will give the definitive answer about everything we need to know about cyberbullying. Partly what I'm coordinating on behalf of the COST action is a full-scale review and a cross-national study of coping. How do children cope across all of the nation countries to do with bullying and these new forms of bullying? So keep an eye for this one as well. I think that sort of sums up a lot of the stuff I'd like to talk about in the presentation. Obviously, there's a lot of other stuff I'd like to talk about, but I'm not allowed to keep you here all day and next week and the week after. Um, I think it is for us as adults, for us as educators, as researchers, as policy makers, as policy disseminators, as parents, just as human beings, it is possible not to be responsible for the problem, but for us to be responsible for that solution. And I think the key thing that I'm picking up from the kids' life and times is that children are saying that bullying is absolutely persistent in their lives. Their personal experience, it's definitely there, and we have an emerging form that we need to get skilled on very quickly because it's going to explode. And the other thing is that no matter which form of bullying, whether you're a bully or a victim, it has very serious effects in the short and possibly long term on education, health and well-being, your future role in society, your future ability to have positive, secure relationships with other people. I think schools are doing a great job. I think they should be commended for that. I think they do a brilliant job in this area. The children are telling us that. And I look forward to seeing these numbers for the amounts of victims and bullies coming down and all of the other figures for schools and the work they're doing going up. So thank you very much. OK, Connor, thank you very much indeed for going over quite a range of um, different findings and the implications of some of it. I mean, as a parent of teenagers, I find it extremely worrying and <laughs> stressing. Um, but and I have a few questions I'd like to ask, but I'm going to open the floor to those of you who are here, because I know many of you are either uh, working with young people or um, are involved with agencies that have concerns about that. So if you'd like to just um, ask your question, feel free to just put up a hand, or if it's just a comment you want to make, you're very welcome. Sorry, can I just ask you to use the mic? Um, not for hearing purposes, but for recording purposes. Hi. Hi. Um, you've talked a lot about the um, actual outcomes of bullying on the victims and stuff, but has there been anything on why people bully and why they target certain, certain people? Is it racial issues? Is it just different sex and gender? Or from the different social backgrounds? Yeah, some of that is very basic and it's very easy to understand. I've bullied you because of a racial issue or because you're a Catholic or a Protestant or I've bullied you because you're gay or something like that or because you're in a wheelchair. Those things are very basic and it's almost the same as adults that there's almost like a legal framework for some of that. But the thing that we do find out is that a lot of those old stereotypes that we have just need to be gotten rid of. That it used to be the view that the bully is like a thug and an oaf and, and just does it because they can. But actually, one of the things we look at is this thing called theory of mind, that can the child actually think in terms of how someone else would think and feel? Almost like what we would call emotional intelligence. And what we find is that the bully is actually very highly socially skilled, by and large. And like anybody who's highly socially skilled, they can use it for very positive interaction or they can use it to be very nasty and destructive. So there's no definitive answer to that, but what we're finding is that the old stereotypes people had just need to be gotten rid of. The same as the old stereotype that everybody tends to think of bullies and victims, as opposed to bullies, victims, bully victims, and bystanders. So we have, you know, whenever journalists might ask me how many children are involved in the bully victim problems at school, well, the answer is 100%. But if you were to say how many are directly involved, it's generally about 75% by the time you take bullies, victims, and bully victims. But we're, we're trying to throw those old stereotypes out. Another one is it's sometimes the most popular, the most sporty kid in school, or the best looking kid, because they've got this little, uh, uh, lith like a little platform that they have, and they can use it, but they can also abuse it as well. So it's, it's not often that they're crying out and it's a self-esteem issue or something like that. 
you do get that. But generally, it's, it's a lot more straightforward. Thanks very much, and congratulations, Connor, on the fantastic amount of work that you're doing in the ABC. Uh, my name is Pat Courtney. I work with the SPHE program down the south. It's terrible to have to come across the border to talk to you when we're a phone <laughs> call away, but we'll address that. But uh, I'm very interested in the uh, area of the uh, SEN, Disabilities to Sexist ho Homophobic, and I see that you, can you give us a little bit more information about the SCOTENS research project? Yes, yeah, SCOTENS is, uh, it stands for the Standing Conference on Teacher Education North and South. And what they're trying to do is they, they fund uh, pretty much pilot research or research that would have an implication for teacher education on both sides of the border. And what we're going to look at in that is do focus groups and interviews with student teachers and teachers here in the north and in the south and explore their knowledge of, at one level, bullying, at another level, special ed and the Epson Act and things like that. And then those two things put together. And what we'll try and be coming up with out of that is, is there something that we could then insert as either a lecture or a couple of lectures or a module in teacher education, north and south? Or if possible, if you could widen out some of the, the remit of SPHE, we could put it in there. But it's really just to, to bring together knowledge from both jurisdictions, do some new research, and try and some kind of outcome that could be across teacher education, north and south. So it's, it's quite new, and we're, we're trying to do that. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm, I'm a retired sort of languages teacher quite some time back, so I'm a bit out of touch. I hope this question doesn't um, uh, reflect my out of touchedness. Um, I'm just wondering if the roots of bullying behaviour could stem from patterns of interaction, action, interaction observed in the home. For example, power control strategies adopted by parents uh, in those dysfunctional kind of settings. So in a way, um, children can be unconsciously mini-scripted to perpetuate patterns of interaction internalised at a very early and an impressionable age. So th this continues sort of in the, the school setting. I, I just wonder, is that a valid kind of reflection? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, the whole social learning that's going on. And this is why we've been trying to look at this within, say, a Northern Ireland framework. Mm -hmm. If you take my generation growing up with a, a daily diet on the, the six o'clock news every day of, of the troubles, so have I picked up a different or a skewed vision of what violence and aggression is? My parents live in at home. Do they have a different view? And does that spill over? But even just your, your, your general comment, can children pick it up? Absolutely. As much as they can pick up really good behavior and model good behavior at home, they, they can absolutely do this as well. Mm -hmm. And we would like to do some of that research with the workplace bullying. Does stuff from the workplace tumble over to one of the parents, tumble over into the household? that low level aggression and then that tumbles forward into the child, into the playground. So it becomes like a vicious cycle. But yeah, ab absolutely. Yes. And it's the same within schools and uh, the SPHE and all of these other things. Almost whenever I go out to schools, I try not to talk as much about bullying as about promoting positive behaviour, about peer support, about mentoring and doing these kind of things. Because if we can keep children on the positive stuff, they stay away from the negative. Mm -hmm as much as possible. But absolutely, that whole social learning approach, yes. yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, near the start uh, that Northern Ireland was culturally distinct or culturally separate from, from uh, uh, the rest of the British Isles uh, in terms of bullying victim problems. Now, is that is is that the case, where 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 that uh, the, the cultural distinctiveness of Northern Ireland um, has an impact on the incidents and nature of bullying, or is that just a, a general comment about yeah. Like, demographics? Yeah, it was just a general problems? comment that that as a society that we are culturally different, and what we were trying to do was find out if we were to measure bullying in Northern Ireland, would it be higher, or would it be lower? or would it be the same? And we sort of were hypothesizing that it might actually be a bit lower because children in Northern Ireland might actually say, well, sure, that's not bullying, sure, like, 
on the scale of what we know to be aggression. Uh, but we haven't got all of that analysis done yet, but that's what we're, we're seeking out. But the, the argument that we thought was interesting was that for quite a long time, uh, schools within the United Kingdom did have to have an anti-bullying policy by law, but not in Northern Ireland for some strange reason. And we were just saying, why would we not then do some research in Northern Ireland and actually try and figure out, is it different? So we were just trying to do that. Um, but the, the, the positive thing about the anti-bullying policies is that now that we do have that legislation, it's very good, it's very strong. It means that children have to be involved in the policy making, parents have to be involved, the schools have to be involved, and it's pretty much a bottom-up approach. So it was more just a general comment about society and what if. Connor, one of the things that I, I think is quite a challenge is that if we look at the new forms of bullying, like cyberbullying, um, you're very clearly saying that obviously cyberbullying is not maintained within the bounds of the school environment. Um, so therefore, if we're going to try to address that, yes, we can um, inform children more, etc. but how do you inform and equip parents better to deal with this? And I mean, are there any pilot projects working, not just with a few parents who might be involved with schools in terms of um, school councils and things, but general parents, if you know yeah. what I mean. Is, is there work going on there? Because I think it is a bit of a, you know, a, a, a dark hole for us because, as you say, we're not upskilled. We yeah. don't use the same technology. We don't live our lives in the same way. So how do we, how do we yeah. protect our children? Yeah, and, and I think I put my hands up. I'm in the same position as well. Whenever we started doing a lot of the European stuff, I was absolutely flabbergasted at, at the range of things that are available to children that, that I had no idea of. There isn't anything majorly going on. Uh, what we do have is we have, uh, uh, we have bids in with the, the European Commission to run out now stuff with parents across all of the partner countries. So it's at that level we're trying to do it and then get country to, countries to buy in below that. But we're trying to drive a lot of this new agenda from the European level. And once it's got the European level built in, we'll get national response to it. There are lots of great things that are out there for parents, but they're not intuitively easy to find. If it was to take uh, what's happening in the South, if you were a parent and you thought, well, cyberbullying is going to be an issue, uh, where would I find information? It's going to be on the Department of Education website. Well, it's not. It's on the Department of Justice, Equality and Law Reform, but it's not, because then from there you have to bunny hop to somewhere else. So unless you're even quite good in the internet, you're not going to find this information. So there isn't anything majorly out there, but I think we do need to start upskilling parents, especially if we're buying mobile phones and stuff. Sorry. Yeah. Very interesting side of the book. I'm a children based section with all of the portals. I mean, I really say if you want parents anywhere, teachers anywhere, if you want one portal in Northern Ireland, yep. which is specific to Northern Ireland, go through that door and it will sign both parents to cyber issues as well as young people yep. and teachers. Not to so that's the one big one. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, as I said, I think the, the NIABF the is, really yeah, and the newsletters, I think it's, uh, it's a great. Side. Okay, uh, just to follow on from that in terms of ARC and the work that we do, is there a need for more information? I mean, I think the parents who want to be informed will try to find information, but I think if we're talking about general mm. um, support for children, there are many, many parents who won't either have the time or the interest or the motivation to do that. So is there a way, like should we be getting some public yeah. information like from the adult survey yeah. to see how yeah. much people are aware of this or considering this or is it an issue for them or yeah. not? Even grandparents, for example, you know, I, I just wonder. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd, I, I'd like to see that in the adult version, mm -hmm. even just a few questions around knowledge, experience, potential fears, and is there a gap between where they see that their knowledge is at and there? Because we could tie that information up with what the children are telling us. And, and I think adults might be fairly open to, to actually saying, on a scale of not to five, this is my internet skills, mobile phones and stuff like that. So I think it would be nice to get like a dipstick and find out what's going on with parents. And I think they, they might be honest to give us those answers. But I think we do need to move that way. Because if we're trying to find out about education and welfare, things to do with children, we need to find out where the parents are at. As, as the point in the slide said, if you, if you don't know it, you can't teach it. So what do we do with parents? Even if they can't log on to uh, NIABF, um, what, what do we do? 
but it would be nice to find out where is their current knowledge set and where do they see their fear or their aspirations in this area. Okay, thanks, Connor. Are there any other questions before we break for lunch or comments that anyone would like to make? Yes, go ahead. Um, you had mentioned there about the schools having um, anti-bullying policies in place. Um, have you done any research with the actual schools themselves to see how they implement these policies? Because um, in some cases, when you know parents are told by their children that you know they've been victim of bullying in school, it's often the case that when they go to you know a teacher or the principal, um, especially where. In maybe the school have, has a very good reputation academic ways, but they'll turn around and say we haven't got a bullying problem in our school and there, therefore the problem isn't being, being dealt with or taken forward and the parent and the child often feel they're on their own, mm. yet they're, they heard that there's other kids in the school have the same problem. So is there something there to actually make sure the schools are taking it seriously and yeah. taking it on board the as law. well? They must have an anti-bullying policy. But then are, are all schools, in some uh, cases, they're not actually implementing it, or parents don't know about it, of how they take Well, yeah, take the law, they, they have to have it, and they have to implement it. And uh, I think what schools, you, got, you can see it in a tumble-down effect. Mm -hmm. They will tell all of the teachers, and they'll have a half day for the, all the teachers, and they'll tell all the kids, but then they won't actually publish it and send all those pages home. But quite often what schools try to do around that is they send home maybe the 10-point discipline policy. And I always find it interesting if a school has maybe 300 children and they send home a 10-point discipline policy. Well, nearly all of the parents sort of get that. In my experience of it, they get it and they look at it and they sort of go, mm, something from the school. And they open up the drawer underneath the knives and forks and shove it in there and it goes into the dark hole. Uh, so the school's not going to purposely send out. Because a lot of principals will say to me anecdotally, why would I send that home? Once I send that home, it's going to become a big stick to beat me with. Every parent's going to be up the gates and saying, point four if your anti-bullying policy says A, B and C. But if a parent does have a concern, they should be able to go to the school and they should be able to say, I want to see your anti-bullying policy. I want to know how you've recorded these incidents. I want to see what you're doing with it. And I want to see what the, the procedure and the policy is here. Absolutely. Um, but sometimes it's not great at saying to parents, these are your rights in this area to do this. But they should do, as good practice. But the law says you have to have the policy and it has to be implemented. No, it's just there's, um, I would be part of a multicultural forum down in Korean area, and there's a, it's from the uh, parental side, there's a representative, and she has, a, she's an ethnic minority, and she's been around, I think, 10 primary schools in the area, and she's, it's something the multicultural forum are trying to pick up on about bullying, and um, she said she's asked them about the, uh, the yeah.